Good afternoon and welcome to the second event in the 2009-2010 State of Democracy Lecture Series. I want to thank all of you for joining us today to hear Professor Leonard Berman, newly appointed inaugural Daniel Patrick Moynihan Chair of Public Administration and Economics. Professor Berman will be speaking on catastrophic budget failure today. And let me first begin by expressing collective gratitude on all of our behalf to the Maxwell School, the Campbell Institute, and its director, Grant Rear, and for their ongoing support of the series. I also want to personally thank um, our Campbell staff, Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman, for their dedication to the series and all of their hard work. Please be sure to mark your calendars for April 16th when we will welcome Laura Nader, Professor of Anthropology at Berkeley and part of America's, um, one of America's most illustrious political families. Professor Nader will be speaking with a provocative title, If We Want to Promote Democracy, We Need to Be One. <laughs> April 16th. As is our usual practice, today's talk will run for about 40 minutes. In a departure from standard practice, we will then turn directly to audience discussion questions in order to make the most of our time with Professor Berman. And now let me offer a few words of introduction for Professor Berman that I hope will convey just how fortunate we are at the Maxwell School to have this scholar and this person among our ranks. Professor Berman received his BA from Wesleyan University in 1975 and his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota in 1985. He is the director emeritus, former director, and co-founder of the Tax Policy Center, a joint project of the Urban Institute and the Brookings Institution. He has held high-level positions in both the executive and the legislative branches, serving as assistant secretary for tax analysis at the Treasury from 1998 to 2000 and senior analyst at the Congressional Budget Office. Professor Berman has also been visiting professor at the Georgetown University Public Policy Institute and a fiscal analysis expert at the International Monetary Fund. His academic research specializes in public finance and modeling the effects of government policies on individual and firms' decisions. He is the author of The Labyrinth of Capital Gains Tax Policy, A Guide for, their perplex for the Perplexed, and co-editor of Taxing Capital Income and Using Taxes to Reform Health Insurance. Professor Berman's current research is focused on long-term budget dynamics, the changing role of taxation in social policy, pension and retirement policy, and tax policy with respect to health insurance. I said when I began my introduction that we are fortunate to have Leonard Berman the scholar and Leonard Berman the person here at the Maxwell School. Let me offer three representative vignettes illustrating why this is so. One, in 2005, Len and his son cycled across the entire United States. While this is impressive, especially to the many cyclists among our ranks, it should also be impressive to us as citizens because Len and Paul raised $108,000 for partners in health an NGO that provides high quality health care and a whole lot more to um, people in Haiti and many other countries where such resources are scarce. Two, in addition to his traditional research, Lan aspires to write an economic novel, possibly featuring a hero who forecasts a coming budgetary catastrophe <laughs> and whose warnings fall on deaf ears. I genuinely look forward to reading this. And three, in a brief introductory conversation, Len managed to convey to me both that his son is his best friend and his wife is his good luck charm. Those are his words. I think these three stories should make clear why we are in the presence of somebody very special. And with that, I want to turn things over to Leonard Berman, scholar, athlete, and citizen. <laughs> Thank you for that. There, there's actually there's a there, there's an artistic reference, and there's going to be a literary allusion later. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction. I have to say that my 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 scholar my 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 uh, athletic prowess has gotten a lot more attention lately. I went to New Zealand, 
And I mentioned in passing that I had played rugby in college. I didn't point out that I paid, played very, very badly. And an article about me said, I was a six foot six inch tall American former rugby player. And actually that's the way I want to be introduced from now on. <laughs> uh, this could only be by someone who never actually saw me play rugby, which is basically I was running behind where the play was supposed to be. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to participate in the State of Democracy lecture series. I, I saw the names of the people who went before me, and it's, it's an amazing group to be a part of. It's a special honor to be the first person from the Maxwell School to, to, to participate in the series, and, and I'm very grateful to Elizabeth and all of her colleagues for making this possible. Uh, this work on catastrophic budget failure is really in the spirit of Pat Moynihan, the, the, the person who's, who's uh, the, the person who's, who, in whose honor the chair is named. He, I'm actually not an expert in catastrophic budget failure. I don't know if anybody is. I'm not an expert in macroeconomics, but I felt empowered when I got this chair because Pat Moynihan wrote about everything. He, you mentioned Nader. Well, he actually wrote about auto safety before Ralph Nader did. And something I read said basically that Nader got his start from Moynihan. <laughs> uh, almost every issue you can imagine he, he weighed in on. So uh, I am no Pat Moynihan, but I, I do feel like the spirit of Pat Moynihan is guiding me here. You know, when I, when I said I was going to be talking about the state of democracy, my wife said, well, you should start at like the State of the Union Address. The State of the Union is good, most presidents say, if you're not Jimmy Carter. And uh, I thought, well, that's pretty funny. But, <laughs> but then I thought, actually, you know, a good summary for the, the talk is, well, the state of democracy is really precarious. And the reason is that we can't handle long-term problems before they become a crisis. And that's really what, 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 what this talk is about, literary reference. This is from... The sun also rises by Ernest Hemingway. How do you go bankrupt, Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said, gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> but basically, that's the way, uh, that's possibly at least the way budget dynamics are playing out. They were accumulating more and more debt. Uh, everybody says, well, this is a problem. It's unsustainable. Nothing really bad happens. We can continue to borrow at very low interest rates. Uh, from a political perspective, it's wonderful. We can give people more government less taxes, everybody's happy until we go over the cliff. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So in outline of the, the talk today, I'm going to talk about the short-term fiscal challenges we're facing, which I think to give us some context on this. I'm going to talk about the enormous long-term fiscal challenges, those charts that suggest the unsustainable budget, the, uh, budget deficits and debt. I'm going to talk about the dynamics of catastrophic budget failure as I understand them now. And I really welcome all of your feedback on this because as I said, this is a work in pro progress and I'm still trying to figure it out. The implications of what I see as catastrophic budget failure and then how to avoid it. And how to avoid it is really important because if I thought we couldn't avoid it, I would just buy golden guns and move to Montana. Uh, so short term problem. This chart shows the latest CBO projections for deficits over the next 10 years. They just announced that the deficit in 2009 was $1.4 trillion, a post-war record, almost 10% of GDP. And a lot of discussion has been about these enormous deficits we're running right now and why they're so bad. I actually don't view the, sh the, the current deficits as catastrophic at all uh, in the context of the financial crisis that we faced and its potential effects on the economy, I think most economists would agree that an enormous fiscal stimulus is warranted right now. The problem, of course, is that all the debt we'd accumulated before this actually made it hard for us to, we probably should be running even bigger deficits, uh, but the big debt overhang might have, might have gotten in the way. It's certainly been a, a talking point for the critics of the economic stimulus measures. Uh, at any rate, the, the deficits we're running right now are likely to be transitory. If you look at the projections for, for two years, we run de deficits of about 10% of GDP, mind-bogglingly large, but they're temporary. And if we were going to get back towards balance after that, they really wouldn't be a big deal. We're a very rich country. We could afford to, to borrow 20% of GDP as long as over time we would be paying it back, or at least not adding more to the debt. 
The thing that's alarming, though, is when you look at these projections, the deficit declines for a couple of years, but then it increases again. And that increase is a result of tax cuts and spending programs that President Obama has promised and basically just a, a big structural deficit that we're facing. And President Obama has said that he understands that there's a budget problem and that he wants to do something about it and we have to make hard choices. But he hasn't, he hasn't actually been willing to say any of the hard choices he's willing to make and that's what causes some alarm. This chart basically shows where we are in the context of the rest of the world, or at least where we were at the end of 2008. The numbers are all outdated. Our deficit is closer to 60% of GDP now. Uh, there's like fancy graphics, I've red, white, and blue for the United States. Uh, in some sense, it looks like good news that our, our de debt at the end of 2008 was 40% of GDP. And relative to a lot of other countries, there are a dozen countries that have bigger debts than we do. So we might infer from that that, well, actually, we're doing relatively well. I would infer from that that the whole world is basically going crazy. And furthermore, that we might not necessarily get very quick, we might not necessarily get the signals we need to have us restrain the debt anytime soon. We've got countries like Greece and Italy, which are fiscally much weaker than the United States, and they're running deficits of around 100% of GDP. <coughs> Uh, and apparently, at least for now, that's possible in part because there's a flood of capital available to prop up even relatively weak countries. Uh, Japan is the, the real outlier, it's the red line, and their, their debt, debt level is get, now getting close to 200% of GDP. But they're kind of an anomaly because at the same time as their government is borrowing a lot of money, the private citizens in Japan are saving an enormous amount. So they're they're, they're, they're borrowing from themselves. A big difference with the United States and Greece and Italy is that we're borrowing a lot from foreigners and that can, can affect how, the, how our, our debt problem evolves over time. The other thing is that, you know, if we were thinking that, well, we could merrily go along and accumulate debt until we have a crisis and then maybe the rest of the world would bail us out, the fact that so many other countries are also in fiscally pre precarious situation and that they're going to go down at the same time that we do, I think is somewhat disconcerting. The long-term problems, though, the thing that really motivates the concern about the budget uh, is the growth, growth of, uh, of spending and of debt uh, over, over the long term. And this chart shows CBO's projections of the three major entitlement programs, programs that primarily benefit the elderly, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And even though you think of Medicaid as providing health care to poor working age people, about a third of Medicaid now is paying for nursing home care and long-term care for the elderly. And over time, that, that, that will, will dominate Medicaid spending. So the big growth in Medicaid over time is paying for long-term care for seniors. Well, if you look at these three charts, the, the, these three programs together, by the year 2000, 2040 or so, they amount to about 18% of GDP, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And why is that alarming? Well, 18% of GDP is the post-war average for tax revenues in the United States, which is to say that if these programs continue on their projected trajectory, uh, they would consume all of, all of federal tax revenues unless, unless we have an increase from the historical average. The other thing that's kind of alarming on this chart is the big red part, which is interest on the debt which is growing at an increasing rate over time. And the assumption in, behind the chart is that Medicare and Medicaid continue to grow at, at roughly their historical rates. That's because healthcare costs grow faster than the economy. The demographics, which are the most predictable part of this, the fact that we have an aging population, and the idea that tax revenues are going to stay at something like their historical norm. You might say, well, that, that can't be true. But in fact, uh, there most Republicans have been arguing that we shouldn't have to raise any more tax revenues than we've raised over the last 50 years. And although the Democrats tend to push back, if you look at their rhetoric, President, President Obama's promised enormous tax cuts to keep tax revenues at a pretty low level. Uh, so what, what this does is it translates into a lot of debt. And CBO had two different scenarios. The first scenario, they actually didn't call it Pollyanna's forecast, I call it that shows debt rising pretty steadily over the next 75 years, but maybe not to an alarming extent. It doesn't get to be 100% of GDP until after 2040. Well, 
the reason I call it Pollyanna's forecast is that this assumes current tax law stays in place, isn't changed, and that health care costs grow slower than they have historically. Well, you might say that current tax law is a reasonable assumption to make for projections, but the fact is, and this is a little known secret, that U.S. income tax is a work of fiction. It's got all of these sunsets built into it. One big part is that all of the tax cuts passed during the Bush administration are supposed to expire at the end of 2010. And under current law, we wake up January 1, 2011 and realize that it was just a bad dream. And our fiscal situation is vastly improved. Uh, it's not going to happen. President Obama has promised to extend most of President Bush's tax cuts. And the one that, and he's got a bunch of other tax cuts for middle income people that we'd add on on top of it. I mean, one of the great ironies of the current situation is that although President Obama criticized President Bush for being fiscally reckless, his measure of fiscal rectitude is doing a little bit better than Bush. It's probably not right. Uh, the other thing that's built into this is this this will be salient to maybe some of the the, the people who actually who filed tax returns in this room is that it assumes the alternative minimum tax uh, never has much of an effect. And it, the alternative minimum tax is this, again, a fictional alternative tax system. You go, through your in, you go through your income tax calculation and then you calculate it under a different set of rules, which, and the reason it's salient to people in, in, in New York is that state and local taxes aren't deductible for the alternative minimum tax. That's why probably most of the professors in this room are subject to the AMT, because state, state taxes are so big. Well, you figure out your taxes under this alternative baseline, and then you, so you have it's a di lot of additional complication, and then you pay more in tax. People don't like it. But the, since 2001, Congress has been patching the alternative minimum tax so that it doesn't apply to too many people. And the reason is that if they didn't apply this annual patch, raising the threshold at which the AMT took effect, they'd be getting 30 million angry letters. Now they only get a couple million angry letters about it. Well, the AMT is supposed to expire, at the, end, the, the patch is supposed to expire at the end of 2009, and then magically a whole bunch of additional revenue is going to come in from the, basically the entire middle class. That's not going to happen either. Uh, now that, so here's a chart that shows what CBO calls the alternative scenario. And it's what happens to debt if you assume that the Bush tax cuts are extended, uh, that the AMT doesn't consume the middle class, and that health care costs continue to grow faster than the rest of the economy. And this is kind of alarming. You know, by within the foreseeable future, by 2040, debt is two times GDP, and then it grows at an increasing rate over time. And the bad news about this really scary chart is that this is like grossly over-optimistic. The reason is that it assumes that the economy continues to grow at historical rates and that interest rates stay low, that we can continue to borrow like 3.5% long term. That's not going to be true forever. It might not be true for long. So I did a little sim simulated alternative where I assumed that in 2020, when, when the debt reaches 100% two, two, reaches of GDP, that interest rates increase to 10% from 3.5%. The, the situation could actually be a lot worse than that. But what you can see is that if interest rates start to increase, that that debt line basically just goes straight north. It goes to two times GDP, three times GDP, four times GDP in a very short period of time. And even that line is way overly optimistic because it assumes <laughs> that, the econ that, that, that the economy continues to grow at 3.5% as it has on average for the last 40 years. Well, when interest rates go up, the, that's, that's going to make it hard for businesses to invest. It's going to make it hard for people to buy homes and cars and things like that. It's going to have a really negative effect on the economy. If GDP fell, here's a little arithmetic question. If you're looking at debt divided by GDP and GDP falls, what happens to debt divided by GDP? The answer is it goes up. So there's actually another line I could show on there, which, which would be just, just a line would just jump up suddenly because it's, it's a, 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 a larger share of a smaller pie. Uh, so, <laughs> it's bad. Uh, it's basically, you know, we start looking like Argentina. Of course, we're not Argentina. We are USA. I was hoping for, like, audio where I could have the chant going, like, during the Olympics. So, I guess the question is, how, how can this happen or can this happen? 
the, obviously, I think it can. Otherwise, I'd be talking about something else. Uh, there are a number of reasons. One is we have a really dysfunctional policy apparatus. This gets to the point of the state of democracy. You know, policymakers want to make people happy, spend more, cut taxes. And the problem is that deficits are a difference between spending and taxes. And if you spend more and you reduce taxes, the difference is the deficit is just going to get bigger and bigger. This was the Obama platform. It was the McCain platform. There was a McCain in 2000 who was very fiscally responsible, and he figured out that he couldn't, he couldn't be his, his party's candidate. So McCain in 2008 proposed enormous tax cuts. Uh, and I don't, I don't think for a minute that he believed they were a good idea, but he thought that's what he needed to do to be elected. Now, as long as interest rates stay low, there's little cost to this kind of political pandering. People don't see an economic consequence uh, from borrowing more money. Uh, second is that politicians have a very short horizon. You know, corporate CEOs have been criticized for doing things to jack up their stock prices in the short term that are bad for the company over the long term. Well, there's kind of a similar dynamic for policymakers, that you want to get reelected, you, uh, you you want to win votes, and basically, if you're not caught when the bubble bursts, when the economy goes down the toilet, uh, then it's a winning strategy to spend more money and cut taxes. Uh, there's it's just a dysfunctional policy apparatus. You know, President Obama clearly understands the long-term problem. You know, he's articulated it very well, but he hasn't had any tangible solutions. The thing that haunts me, uh, you know, I, I, I did serve in the Clinton administration, and the scariest people I met in the Clinton administration were the pollsters who sat on the couch when economic policies were being debated. So people would sit around the table, the principals, the Secretary of the Treasury, the National Economic Advisor, the Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, smart people who really cared about policy, at least on a good day. And, and they would talk about difficult policy choices that had to be made. And you'd be on the verge of having a decision made, maybe send something to the president, say, give one of those great speeches and get people to do the right thing. And then the pollster would say, well, we really have to deal with this. This is what we're here to do. But if we take it on right now, it'll get in the way of these other priorities, and Democrats won't get elected, and the bad guys will take over. So if the bad guys take over, they won't do the good things either, and they're the bad guys too, so it's even worse. So let's put it off right now until we get this other stuff taken care of. And I don't, I'm not in the room with the Obama White House. They're kind of mad at me because of the things I said about their tax proposals during the campaign. But I know that those pollsters are still sitting on the couch. They're saying, well, you want to do health care. You want to deal with the environment. You want to solve the problems in Afghanistan. And if we make the deficit an issue right now, we're going to lose in the polls because people are going to be unhappy that we're proposing tax increases uh, and spending cuts. And you're, you're not going to be able to get these other things done, which are really high priorities. So we should deal with those next year. And that'll always be the right answer. We should always deal with those next year. Uh, there's party politics. You know, one thing that's really striking, I, I've been in closed door meetings with Republican and Democratic congressmen when they're starting out. The Congressional Research Service has a seminar where they bring in new members of Congress to talk about policy issues. And they are as cute as could be. I mean, they're just incredibly lovable, Republicans and Democrats alike. And you realize that people are elected to Congress not because they want to launch hand grenades at the other guys, at least the people who come to these seminars. They're elected because they, they, they understand that we have serious problems and they want to deal with them. And, and you have the feeling that if people would leave the room in the spirit in which they're, you know, if they'd actually legislate in the spirit in which they're at these seminars, that they would sit down together and they would tackle the hard problems and we'd be a much better country as a result. We might not like every, we might not like every decision. Like, you know, I did this when Republicans had overwhelming wins in, in Congress. And I know that they would have probably wanted to cut spending more than I would have. But, but they would have acknowledged the constraints and they would have made the hard choices. But as soon as they leave the room, it turns from something about policy into a football game. And the only thing that matters is scoring, a point, scoring points on the other guys. And that's the really, really scary thing. I was in the Obama administration when Republicans made proposals that were clearly good policy. And we all agreed they were good policy. I said, well, we should go out there and say it's good policy and help them get it done. No, they're going to get credit for it. 
it's really messed up. Uh, you know, if you could, so the problem is that there was this dynamic where one party plays Santa Claus, and if the other party play, plays Scrooge, or the adult, they get voted out. So you have two Santa Clauses. The Republican Santa Clauses give you tax cuts and more spending, and the Democratic Santa Clauses give you tax cuts and more spending, and the deficit gets bigger and bigger. Uh, another, reason why, another reason why I'm concerned is because of financial markets. You know, if financial markets knew how to price risk, they would be sending a signal to the U.S. Treasury that, you know, your policies aren't that wise over the long term, and you're going to have to pay more to borrow money than you do right now. Well, these are the same geniuses who thought that they could make money by lending to people with no reliable source of income and no down payments. And the logic was, this is the subprime mortgage crisis, that as long as housing prices continued to rise at 10% a year and interest rates stayed low, people could refinance and they could pay back their mortgages. Or if they couldn't pay back their mortgages, they could sell to somebody else who could pay, who could pay it off. And it was true for as long as it was true. You know, the easy, flood of, easy supply of money at very low interest rates kept housing prices increasing very rapidly. As long as housing prices were, in, were increasing rapidly, it made sense to make the loans until, of course, it wasn't. And then housing prices dropped pretty, pretty precipitously, and all of these mortgages turned out to be the bad deals that they were all along. You have sort of a similar dynamic with government debt, that as long as we can borrow at 3% a year, we can roll over our debt. We could have debt of 100% of GDP, 200% of GDP, and the loans come due, we borrow more money, we pay off the loans, and everybody's happy. It's kind of a Ponzi scheme, but <laughs> you know, as long as interest rates stay low, it sort of makes sense. Well, the, so the, the problem is there, there are models of how, uh, of how the financial market might respond. And basically, the investors say, well, at a 3% interest rate, the US Treasury is good for it. And that's true for a long time. And then at some point, somebody says, well, even at a 3% interest rate, there's a little risk that Treasury is not going to be able to pay back these loans that we're making. So we have to increase the interest rate. That increases the risk that we can't pay it back. So they have to increase the interest rate some more. You have this vicious cycle. And then, so the, the problem is instead of interest rates increasing gradually, they stay low for a long time, and then all of a sudden there's no interest rate at which it's safe to lend to the U.S. Treasury because the expectations that there's a likelihood of default makes it a foregone conclusion that default will occur. And that is basically what catastrophic budget failure looks like. Now, the other problem is you've got financial markets, which probably aren't going to save us. You also have foreigners who are lending to the US, the U.S. Treasury, and their interests aren't necessarily the same as either a rational investors or the U.S. government. Half of our debt right now is held by foreigners. That's what this, this pie chart shows. At $3.4 trillion of debt in July 2009 uh, that's held by foreigners. The biggest of those is, is China, which holds almost a quarter of the external debt, and Japan, which holds uh, nearly as much. Well, their incentive for lending to us, there's part of it is that they'd like to be paid back. You know, maybe they think the U.S. Is a, is a relatively safe investment. But a big motivation for their sending us the money is that what do we do with the money? We buy their goods. When you go to Walmart, you're basically, the reason, the reason we have all of these imports from China is because we are spending way more than we produce. The government is borrowing, and businesses are investing more than we save. So there's this big imbalance. And the deficit is made up by imports from abroad, from China, from Japan, from the oil countries. So they've got an incentive to keep the cash coming into the U.S. so we can keep on buying their goods. Uh, even if they thought that, I mean, now that they're in so deeply, even if, they, even if they thought that maybe we're not such a good investment going forward, they have to think in the back of their minds that if they pull the plug on U.S. borrowing, that that would, re, that would push up interest rates in the United States. We wouldn't be able to buy so much of their stuff. And we would bring their economy down along with theirs because they're so dependent on exports to the U.S. So they have ulterior motives to keep on lending. They don't have unlimited ability to do it, though. And at some point, 
Either they're going to run out of money because the U.S. is so big relative to the rest of the world and our debt is growing at such an alarming rate, or they'll just do a cost-benefit calculation and say, down the road, the U.S. is a basket case, and you know, at some point, they're going to come crashing down, and there's going to be big problems for us, but we're better off cutting our losses now than waiting 5 or 10 or 15 years down the road. And that's when catastrophic budget failure happens. So what does a debt crisis look like? Well, we actually have some, some hints of it already. In the short term, the debt is already limiting our options. I mentioned that our fiscal stimulus is probably smaller than it would be if we didn't have this big overhang of debt. I mean, certainly critics of the economic stimulus, the, the money the government's spending to try to get us out of recession, uh, are saying that we can't afford it because we have these big deficits and big debts. Uh, and I, and that's, that's a problem. There were two articles in Sunday's New York Times magazine that illustrate other parts of the problem. Uh, one was titled, China's role as, China's role as lender alters Obama, Obama's visit. And what they said was that, uh, previous presidents, including President Bush, had pushed China on human rights and on other issues. Obama is walking their hat in hand saying, well, you know, we like everything about you and please keep on sending us money. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure it's not quite that bad. But I mean, uh, the fact is the United States has to think that with $800 billion of our debt that's held by China, that we can't afford to, 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 to make them mad because they could they could ruin our economy in a second. There was an article in The Atlantic about a year ago. It was titled, Be Nice to the Countries that Lend You Money. It was a quote from a Chinese financier who basically said the United States, you know, the United States had to think about the effects of its policies on China because if we didn't, they could punish us. That's kind of frightening. There's another article in the Sunday New York Times called High Costs Way on Troop Debate for the Afghan War. Now, I'm not going to take a position on whether more troops in Afghanistan are a good idea or a bad idea. But if it is a good idea, it would be a little bit disturbing to think that we couldn't do it because, because of the, the huge debt overhang. Uh, over the long term, how is this likely to play out? Well, so what happens when the bubble bursts? One thing is it depends, it's going to depend in part on what the term structure and the maturity structure of our debt is. If all of if, if the government just issued 30-year bonds, then in any one year, we'd only be, be paying a tiny fraction of the debt back. It would be a little bit more than 130th. It might be you know, 5% of the overall debt. And you think, well, if our debt level was two times GDP, 5% of that would be 10% of GDP. That's a lot of money. That's more money than we raise from the income tax. But at least with some time, we could, probably, we could put a new tax in place and raise that much money. The problem is that most of our debt is very short term. This chart shows that in 2009, 40% uh, of our debt had a maturity of, of, of two years or less. $1.6 trillion came, was coming due in 2009 and another $1.2 trillion in 2010. Now in, the, in that context, if, if all of a sudden nobody wanted to lend to the US and we had to come up with $1.6 trillion, that would be a problem. It's twice what we raise in individual income tax revenues in 2009. Now, you know, we've got the Federal Reserve. They could, they could buy debt, at least in the short term. But the, prob the, the point is that the, the more short term our debt is, the more severe the crisis is going to be when it comes. At, at the point at which we can't just roll over our debt, we have a lot of money we have to come up with. You, say, you might say, well, the solution then would be we should borrow we should turn all of our debt into 30-year bonds. Problem is, one, there, there are a couple. One is 30-year bonds cost a lot more than, than one or two-year bonds. One-year one year treasuries are like one to one and a half percent interest rate. 30 years are three and a half percent. The other thing is that if we started to spread out the maturity for our debt, lenders would say, why are they doing that? It's probably because they're afraid that they're not going to be able to pay back. So they would push up, well, maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they're not bright enough to figure that out. But it might, might be seen as a signal that, that we're not very confident in our, in our ability to, to repay the loans. So suppose crisis occurs. You know, multiply all those things by four. You know, say we just play this out until, until, uh, in, until our debt is two times GDP, at which point instead of $1.6 trillion, we have to pay back $6 trillion in a year. 
and we can't do it. Well, there are some historical examples. One is from Syracuse. Not Syracuse, New York, but Syracuse in Sicily in 400 BC. It was the, the largest, I think it was the largest Greek state outside of Greece. And the, the ruler of, of, of ancient, ancient Syracuse was Dionysius the Elder. And he had a debt crisis. He had a debt crisis because, because he was a horrible despot. He, he, did, he did party well, and he would invite people to these big parties. But he also liked to buy, he liked to have jewelry and gold and all sorts of other things. And he kept on running into trouble. But one time, he had, he had all these loans that his citizens had, had given to him, and he couldn't pay them back. So he came up with this great idea. He commanded all of his subjects, on penalty of death, to turn in their one drachma coins. And he stamped them two drachmas, and then he paid them back. <laughs> uh, you got France in the 17th century, uh, which also had a debt crisis. Most of their debt was held by, by royalty in France. And the solution to that debt crisis was they started executing the creditors until the others decided they didn't actually want to be paid back. Uh, the book that told me about this said this was an early and decisive form of debt restructuring. <laughs> uh, more recent example of what might happen is Newfoundland in 1934. Newfoundland had accumulated enormous debts in the run-up to the Depression, and they were actually doing pretty well because fish prices were really high. But in the Depression, all commodity prices collapsed. Their debt was more than three times GDP. And in 1934, the United Kingdom actually just took over Newfoundland. It was, it was part of the Commonwealth, but the UK took them over. And then in 1949, they ceded them to Canada. So the country actually lost its sovereignty uh, because of a debt crisis. There was a royal commission that did an analysis of, of Newfoundland's, the, what, the problems that led, led up to the debt crisis. And this is, this is kind of eerie. This is a quote. Rival politicians in the desire to secure election were accustomed to make the wildest promises involving increased public expenditure in the constituency and the satisfaction of all the cherished desires of the inhabitants. The latter, as was natural, chose the candidate who promised them the most. Uh, okay, so we're probably, we're probably not going to execute our creditors. Uh, we might do something similar to turning our one drachma coins into two, although we would use the Fed to do it instead. We're probably not going to get subsumed into Canada, uh, although that would solve some issues we, we've had with them for a long time uh, from their perspective. But you know, another thing that's happened more recently is that the, uh, we have the IMF. We have this international financial institution that's supposed to help with particularly liquidity crises, but also debt crises. Well, we're way too big for the IMF to bail out. So you know, it's possible that our creditors would agree to debt restructuring, but only if we promise to slash spending and raise taxes. And it is the answer people ask me, you know, when, when are we going to have a value-added tax in the United States, a national sales tax? And the answer could be, well, when we have to pledge it as collateral for the debt restructuring that the Chinese, Japanese, and Arab countries force on us in, in exchange for letting us roll over our debt one more time. It would be the most humiliating moment probably in, in our history. Uh, and it might still not be enough, because if you think about what would happen, we raise taxes dramatically, we cut spending to the bone, and interest rates go up a lot, as they would inevitably if people didn't want to hold dollars anymore. And the consequent, if you're trying to create a, a recipe book for a depression, a really great depression, that would be the way to do it. So that's why it's a little bit scary. So you know, the, the, the options are we could default on some or all of the public debt. That would obviously have some foreign policy implications. We'd be a pariah, more of a pariah than we've ever been with respect to the rest of the world. We wouldn't be able to borrow any, any, any new money. And interest rates in the US would go up dramatically. Nobody would want to hold dollars anymore. Uh, the other thing, if you think about it, is if we defaulted on the debt, you know, one, one thing that's going to come out of the current financial crisis is we're going to make a lot more kinds of financial institutions hold government bonds as collateral. These are the safe asset. Well, we'd be bringing down financial institutions by reneging on the safe asset that we're forcing them to hold, which is really disturbing. The most, com the most popular way to deal with the debt crisis is to print money. Uh, and, but that actually works out really badly as well. And it's, it's tantamount to a partial default because 
We're saying, well, you borrowed a dollar from us, but now a dollar is only worth 50 cents or 40 cents or 30 cents. It can work out very badly in the form of hyperinflation. It's economically inefficient. Uh, it would certainly cause a massive economic contraction. We have high inflation. Interest rates would go through the roof. Nobody would be able to borrow for anything. Uh, and we'd still have to raise taxes and cut spending. You can think about Weimar Republic or Argentina. The analogies are not very, very cheery. So, so here's the upbeat and positive part of the presentation. How do we avert the crisis? Well, one possibility is rational, far-sighted financial markets. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually was a laugh line. I mean, it actually did work in the early 19, I mean, it wasn't, in the early 1980s, we weren't as integrated with the rest of the world. And we were running what seemed, what, what were at that point, record post-war deficits. And interest rates went up. A lot of people remember that Ronald Reagan passed the largest tax cut in history, but he also passed the largest tax increase. And the reason was that Wall Street went to him and said, these high interest rates are killing us. We can't borrow to make investments. So consumers couldn't borrow for homes. And that was why he reluctantly agreed to raise taxes. He actually gave a pretty good speech in favor of it that I would love for a Democrat or Republican to give today. Uh, the problem with this scenario is, one, financial markets aren't very bright. And we saw those, fin those foreigners who have ulterior motives for lending to us. The second option is that the Chinese start investing at home. You know, one of the big puzzles is why they're not doing that now. And they're, 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 they've, they've, had, they've been an enormous success story in terms of economic growth over the last 20 years, but they're still pretty poor, and the Chinese people save half of their income. So you would think that the Chinese would want to spur development by spurring consumption at home. Uh, and actually, President Obama has urged them to do that. It's a little bit ironic. He's like you know, saying, stop enabling us. Stop flooding the world with money. So, so it will be easier for us to behave well. Uh, the question, the, the real issue, well, nobody knows why it's not happening now. Uh, it could be that next year they'll decide to create a social safety net. If they had something like Social Security, the Chinese people wouldn't feel like they had to save so much. Uh, they could invest in infrastructure and education. Uh, but I'm not sure you can bet on that either. Another option is that the public wakes up. And we know that people care about deficits in the sense that if you ask them, do you care, they say, yeah. Uh, but the problem is they don't care about deficits as much as they care about their favorite government programs or having lower taxes. So the question is, and I don't really know the answer, but will there be some point at which debt becomes salient? It could be that next year when our debt reaches 60% of GDP and somebody, if nobody else does, I will point out that at that level, we wouldn't qualify for admission to the European Union. We won't meet the threshold that Poland and Estonia had to reach to join the European Union, although the earlier chart showed most of those countries wouldn't be able to meet that threshold now either. Uh, it could be when debt reaches 109% of GDP, which was a level at the end of World War II, and which was a debt level that was very alarming and which we paid down very, very quickly. It could be that voters will perceive a connection between budget deficits and trade deficits when they're complaining about the fact that we're importing so much more than we're exporting, that maybe somebody will notice that a big component to that is that we're borrowing so much. Uh, the political science literature says that the way you change public opinion is to reach the media, that the media has this agenda-setting role. So the question is, when will the media start reporting on this as a, as a problem? And there are, there are articles about the debt. I, I'm interviewed for some of them, so I'm aware of those. Uh, but the problem with the debt is that as long as a crisis doesn't occur, it's hard to say it's news. And it's hard to get editors to say, well, write about this saying sometime in the indefinite future something really bad will happen, therefore we should do something now. It's a hard sell. Uh, how do we avoid catastrophic budget failure as a matter of policy? Well, one thing is we raise revenue and we cut spending. And the sooner we do that, the better. This is a, a chart showing the, the tax increases or spending cuts that would be necessary to eliminate the fiscal gap, the long-term structural different deficit between revenue and spending, according to the General Accounting Office. And there are a couple of things that are kind of striking about this chart. One is that if you're going to try to deal with the problem either with taxes alone or spending alone, you would need enormous changes, 47% tax increase. That is another individual income tax on top of the individual income tax we have and corporate taxes and Social Security taxes. Or cutting non-interest spending by a third. 
uh, that's more than the amount, much more than the amount of non-defense discretionary spending, the part that's easiest to, to manipulate. Uh, and if we wait 10 years, all those numbers get dramatically worse, that the required tax hike would be 58%, the required spending cut would be 39%. So two lessons. One is that we're not going to deal with this problem with either spending cuts or tax increases alone. And second, the sooner we deal with it, the easier it will be. Uh, how do we make these changes? The, I guess I, sh I should mention, I've got a proposal to deal with all this by putting in place a value-added tax to pay for health care. And if you're interested, you can find the, the paper on Tax Policy Center's website. It's got no political prospects whatsoever, but people do find it curiously fascinating. Uh, and it makes perfect sense from a point of view of somebody who will never be elected dog catcher. Uh, another thing is to reform political institutions so policymakers' interests are more aligned with the public's. The conventional wisdom is very defeatist. One reason why it's good for me to leave Washington is that in Washington, people say, you can't do anything about this. You can't put in place any budget rules that will bind Congress unless they want to be bound. And maybe in some kind of tautological sense that's true, but the fact is, I think policymakers would love to have a reason to say, well, I really would love to cut taxes, or I really would love to enact this new spending program, but I can't because I've got these nasty rules in place that keep me from doing it. So it's possible, and I, I don't think you should give up on budget rules. There's a proposal by Senator Conrad, who's the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, and Senator Gregg, who's the ranking member, for a budget commission. And it'll be like the base closing commission. This is a, an independent body that creates proposals to close, mil close military bases. This is something that's very difficult for politicians to deal with because you always want to save the military base in your own district. But these things come up for an up or down vote, and it's been kind of successful. A lot of, mili a lot of excess military capacity has been, been shut down as a result. The Budget Commission, though, I think is more problematic because this is like the essential function of government is raising taxes and deciding how the money would be spent. And the idea that that would be ceded to an independent body is maybe problematic. The third option, and this is my own idea, and I haven't seen anybody else mention it, so it must be really crazy, uh, is pay for performance. And the idea is that you give uh, politicians bonuses for meeting budgetary targets. There are a couple of problems. One is figuring out budgetary targets that make sense, which is not a trivial matter, but I, I think we could do that. Uh, second is we have the example of like pay for performance for CEOs, where the CEOs basically just manipulate the whole system to make things worse. But I think it could be effective. And the reason is that politicians, for one thing, are not paid very well. You won't believe this, but there are people at Syracuse University who make more money than congressmen and senators. And this really annoys congressmen and senators. Uh, and, and CEOs get paid 10 or 100 times as much as congressmen and senators, or even more. Uh, we know the politicians respond to financial incentives. So Dan Rostenkowski, who is one of the most powerful members of Congress, <laughs> ended up going to jail for stealing postage stamps. So we could make it a little bit easier for them to augment their, their paychecks. It's just an idea. So the other option is we could try to educate the public and the press. Uh, we've convinced the media that it's news. And what I want to do is to actually make, the, I'm actually planning, I'm building a model of catastrophic budget failure, coming out in gruesome detail with exactly how bad the budget crisis would be. It's not because I, I think I know the answer. You have to make so many assumptions. What are the Chinese going to do? Uh, what's the point at which financial, you know, what's the point at which, how do the financial institutions price the risk of, of government default and so on? But what I've learned in Washington is that if you make things very concrete, if you give people actual numbers, they respond in ways that they can't by just, you know, everybody in Washington or all the policy analysts say, well, the budget is unsustainable. It's become this mantra. You can tell a budget analyst because they go around mumbling, unsustainable, unsustainable. <laughs> and it's, it's true, and nobody knows what that means. So I'm going to make it very, very concrete. It's mostly going to be storytelling with numbers. It's mostly going to be m probably more appropriate for a novel than an analytical text, although I'm actually working on the analytical text in the novel I'm not sure about. Uh, and... Hopefully, it'll be a way to break through and raise public's consciousness. The other thing is there are a bunch of young people here, and you ought to be out there. If you're the ones who actually, you're going to get screwed if this bubble bursts. <laughs> so you should be out there just raising hell. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions.